that we thank God tonight for his love and for his faithfulness. <coughs> Just for two brief but necessary announcements. On Wednesday evening at half past seven it is our church night when we meet for praise and for the study of God's word and for prayer. And our brother, Mr. Brian Higginson, will be bringing the word on Wednesday evening. So do keep that in mind and make that effort to be present again at church night. As the church here already do, the uh, Thanksgiving service for our late brother Joe Coulter will take place tomorrow morning here at half past ten. So do keep that in mind. We're going to continue to praise God as we focus our attention on the greatness of our God and sing these lovely words, Behold our God. Let's stand to praise Him this evening. Thank you.
Let's just do that this evening as we bow quietly, thoughtfully, perfect night in the Lord's presence. <coughs> Father, we thank you for this tremendous privilege that you've given to us to bow in your presence and at your throne of grace. We thank you for these words that we've just been singing, Behold our God. And we recognize tonight that he is the one who is seated on the throne. He is the one who holds the ocean in his hands. He is the one who has numbered every grain of sand. He is above, beyond, and before all things. And yet, we can come to him and call him our Father. We thank you tonight for your great plan of salvation. We thank you for ever thinking about us long before we ever thought of you. We praise you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, from the highest heights of heaven to that place called Calvary, the one who was nailed to the cross, the one who bore all the guilt of sinful man, the eternal God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was truly God and truly man, who humbled himself even unto death, who went to the grave, but on the third day rose again. And tonight he's arisen, glorified, exalted, and soon coming Savior. Oh God, we worship you, my God. We praise you, my great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And as we worship you and sing your praise and proclaim the glorious good news of your redeeming love in Jesus Christ, speak to all our hearts tonight. You just know who we are and where we are. You know our need this evening. And we thank you that you're a God who is greater than all our problems and greater than all our fears. We thank you for your goodness to us already today, for enduring mercies, for the measure of health and strength that we enjoy and can so easily take for granted. We thank you for those in the meeting tonight who have been too well and you've restored them in health and strength. We thank you for their presence with us tonight. We pray that you'll bless each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to listen to your word. Help us, O oh God, to be attentive to the things which are which are of eternal significance. Oh God, you want to speak to us tonight. And we pray that we will have ears to hear. You want to show us things from your word, give us eyes to see. You want to speak into our hearts and into our lives. And give us that receptive heart and that responsive spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you for an open door. We thank you for this building in which we meet tonight. We pray for every church, for every mission hall, uh, for every place that is open for the preaching of the glorious gospel of the grace of God. Bless our land tonight. Bless our province. Bless this community in which we're meeting tonight. Oh God, pour out your spirit in these needy days. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our world tonight. And we thank you and praise God that before this day, Rose is courts, men and women, boys and girls who have trusted Christ. Lord, we rejoice in the great truth that came from the very lips of the Lord Jesus when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hear our cry this night. Bless those who are in need. Remember again in our prayers the Coulter family circle tonight. Thank you for every remembrance of Job. We thank you as a home with the Lord tonight. He is rejoicing in the presence of the Savior whom he loved and served so well. Remember his children tonight. We pray that you'll bless them. And in anticipation of the Thanksgiving service tomorrow, we pray that your presence may be real to all who will gather here. And as we rejoice in a life well lived and in the grace of God manifest in your child, that you will speak into the hearts of the people. So hear us this night, and bless us as we continue in your presence. For Jesus' sake. 
Amen. We're going to sing about the cross of our Lord Jesus Isaac Watts with him, lovely him, when I survey the wondrous cross. Let's stand to sing this hymn together. Thank you. Witness to it. 
the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time, so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is God's Word, and we thank God for His Word. Almost 540 years ago, on the 10th of November in 19, uh, 1483, a boy was born into a humble miner's home in Germany. In common with all around them, the parents were practicing Roman Catholics. And they named their boy Martin after one of the most respected saints of the Roman Catholic Church. As a young lad, Martin was already showing unusual ability. He was brought up in poverty, his father working at different times as a woodcutter, a miner, and a, mel a, mel a melter of copper ore. Both parents were pious in their religion, teaching their children the Ten Commandments, uh, the Creed and the Lord's Prayer. One writer says the teaching which young Martin received as a child was the seed of his theology, the truth which he preached to all men he learned at home. Who am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about Martin Luther, the great reformer. Martin Luther was brought up strictly and severely at times, both at school and at home. And later in his life, he considered his upbringing had been too hard and too harsh. He writes, it was necessary to punish, but the apple should be placed near to the rod. Chastisement and fear were the chief incentives to study in Luther's day. It was little wonder that every time he heard his teacher speak of Jesus Christ, he turned pale when the Saviour had been presented to him as an offended judge. His religion was marked by slavish fear. Hans and Margrethe Luther wished to make their son a scholar. At a tremendous cost on their part, they sent him to a Franciscan school at the age of 14, often finding themselves in great poverty and begging for money necessary for his studies and livelihood as he advanced as an excellent student. One writer says the strength of his understanding, the liveliness of his imagination, the excellency of his memory soon carried him beyond all his fellow students. At the age of 18, in 1805, he was sent to a university in Beaufort. At this stage in his life, Luther was beginning to have serious thoughts about God. And he spent much time in prayer and other religious exercises. The young student spent most of, most of his spare time in the university library. And books, as you can understand, were rare in those days and were uh, regarded as absolute treasures. Luther had been two years in the university when one volume in particular had attracted his attention, and it was the Bible. Until then, he thought that selections read from the Gospels and the Epistles, which were read at services, comprised all other ones of the Word of God. Now he saw many books which he never heard of, and with eagerness and intense emotion he began to read the Bible. The same year he received his bachelor's degree, and some years later in 1505 he was admitted the Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy. 
Noah Martin was ready to apply himself to the study of law as his father wished him to do. However, this young man's heart remained unsatisfied. Becoming aware of inward corruption, he longed for peace of soul and heart and mind. And on a certain day in that year, 1505, he was very nearly killed by a thunderbolt that struck him to the ground during a terrifying storm. He was terrified and he prayed saying, help me, St. Anne. He was brought up, of course, in the Roman Catholic faith, remember, and so he prayed, help me, St. Anne, and I will become a monk. He came face to face with death. And he was not ready for it. He was terrified and deeply convicted. And he never forgot that day. One historian said that the Reformation started with a thunderbolt. And you know when a man or woman becomes so intent in not listening or responding to the preaching of the gospel, God has other ways of calling their attention to the truth. And God has many thunderbolts that he can fire and uh, many earthquakes he can send. Last week uh, we looked at Acts chapter 16 and saw that very thing happen in the experience of the jailer. And here, in the midst of a terrible storm, <coughs> Luther falls to his knees and vowed that if the Lord should deliver him from his danger, he would abandon the world and devote himself entirely to God's servants. The 17th of August, 1505, age 21, Martin Luther, in the darkness of the night, knocked on the gate of the Augustine convent in Euford, and he was determined to find peace with God. And the monks received this distinguished scholar with joy, and then <laughs> proceeded to humble him by teaching him harshly and giving him the most menial task to perform. Again, he turned to the scriptures, this time in their original languages. And at the same time he sought to mortify the flesh by fastings and by scourgings. One writer says, never did Rome possess a more pious monk. If ever a monk could obtain heaven by monkish works, I should certainly have been entitled to it. But Luther's monkish works brought him no peace. He had what he considered the privilege of visiting Rome. When he saw the city from a distance, he cried out, Hail, Holy Rome. He climbed the 28 steps, praying on each step, hoping that his grandfather, who was dead, uh, would help him through purgatory, and he would help him through purgatory. When he saw in Rome, however, and what he heard in Rome was to convince him was not to convince him anything other than he needed something. Priests were given to levity and immorality, and the highest offices were defiled by many heinous sins. But on his way home, he, he wondered about the benefits of Holy Rome. His sense of sins, as he come, came from Rome, intensified and became more real on his return journey. Still, this young man had no peace. And striving to fit himself for God and his service, he embraced on fast and on vigils, in penance, in prayers, and he later reflected, if I kept <coughs> all of this any longer, I would have killed myself. At that particular time, there was a man called John Stop it. Who after a long struggle had himself found peace with God through faith in the Lord Jesus. He noticed that the young Martin Luther was dejected, scarcely touching his food, and soon he spoke to him, and Luther was soon under unburdening his needy heart and soul to this man. Having listened to Luther sympathetically, John Stop his reply. <coughs> Look at the wounds of Jesus Christ. Look to his blood that he has shed for you instead of torturing yourself on account of your sin. Throw yourself into the Redeemer's arms. Trust in him 
in the righteousness of his life and the atonement of his death. And Luther listened with great intent. Sometime later, another age friend spoke to him, reminding him of the words of the creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And Luther agreed with the creed. Ah, said his wise friend, you must not just believe that David's sins are forgiven and Peter's sins are forgiven. For even the devil believes that. It is God's command that we believe our own sins are forgiven. And it was in this moment that light began to dawn on Luther's soul. And he found peace. The word of grace had been spoken. And he believed it. You see, he said all the right things. He tried all the methods that had been spoken to him. And he saw right away the implications and consequences of this belief. And the great change took place. He renounced all human merit. He renounced all dependence upon anything that he had ever done and could ever do. And he resigned himself to the grace of God in Christ. Listen to what Luther said. He said, I felt as if I were born anew. It was as if I found the door of paradise thrown over mine. Now I saw the scriptures in a new light, God's light. The expression, the righteousness of God, which I so hid it before, now became dear and precious to me. My comforting word. Luther had trembled. He trembled like a slave. Now he was rejoicing like a son in his father's house. He found the answer to the question that was posed by the Old Testament writer in the book of Job. How then can a man be made right before God? That's the most important question that you and I need to find an answer for. How can a man or a woman be made righteous, be justified before God? And he discovered what Paul meant in Romans chapter 1 when he said, The just shall live by faith. He understood in some measure what Paul said in Romans 3, words that we read this evening, we are justified freely by his grace. And he often would have reminded people of four great biblical truths that emerge from this man's experience <coughs> of the grace of God. We've been looking at great men and their texts. Last Sunday night, Thomas Chalmers, that godly Scottish Presbyterian minister, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Tonight, the reformer Martin Luther, the just shall live by faith. That we are justified, we are made righteous before God, freely by His grace. And here were the four great truths. That a man or a woman is saved by the free grace of God. Secondly, that a man cannot choose Christ until Christ first chooses him. Thirdly, that a man or a woman can make no contribution to their salvation whatsoever. And fourthly, that God brings into a man's heart by grace through faith alone, in Christ alone, the salvation of God. I wonder have you made these discoveries tonight? That we're justified freely by His grace. You see, this word tells me something about the attitude of God. And there are four things I want to say about this word very briefly, very simply. First of all, this word is a corrective word. It's a corrective word. I believe that it touches on the basic blunder that 
humanity, all of us tend to be. We're trying to solve the problem of getting right with God and we don't begin with God, we begin with ourselves. We say, well, I go to church, I live a very decent life by the day of standards, I'm as good as the next fellow. But if we begin with ourselves, we begin at the wrong end. We have to begin with God and God's grace to get the answer that we need. You see, the first step in solving the problem in, 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 of being right with God is not the discovery of something good in ourselves, but discovering something in the heart of God that moves them to meet sinners in all their great spiritual need. If we're going to be justified, made righteous before God, it will only be through what He has done. We must begin with God, with His free, unmerited favor. That is grace, unearned, undeserved. It's a corrective word. Many people are not converted tonight, many people are not Christians tonight, because they do not start at the right place. They've got to start by a realization that they need grace. That without grace they're lost and lost forever. It's a corrective word. Now the second thing tonight is this, it's a destructive word. It's a destructive word. What do I mean by that? I mean it's a destructive word because it shatters and destroys our pride and conceit. We've read tonight from Romans chapter 3, the Bible says that there's no difference. For all sin comes short of the glory of God. There is absolutely nothing in us that can ever constitute any claim whatsoever on God apart from our need. If you and I are going to be brought into a right relationship with God, it will only be because of God's grace. I say it again, his free, unmerited favor. And that's a word that takes a terrific weight off our shoulders. Grace. Grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. You see, the answer to all our spiritual needs tonight begins in the heart of God and reaches down to each one of us in our sin. It's a corrective word. It is a destructive word. <coughs> and then thirdly, it is an instructive word. Listen to what Paul says uh, when he writes in Titus chapter 3. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. I thought you said that good works don't get you to heaven. That's right. Good works are not the condition of salvation. Good works are the consequence of salvation. If you are a Christian, if you're a child of God tonight, if you have experienced the grace of God in salvation, listen to this instruction that Paul gives. You see, there are many people and they abuse the grace of God and they teach us. They teach that if you're saved by grace, that means you can do whatever you want to do. That's not what the Bible says. Listen to how the Bible defines grace. Listen to this instructive message about grace. The grace of God has appeared. What does it do? It brings salvation. How does salvation affect us. It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions 
and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope. What is our blessed hope tonight? The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, if you are a child of God tonight, through the grace of God tonight, then you've come to appreciate what God has done for you in Christ. This word is a corrective word. It teaches me what I need to know about God, that God is gracious, that God is good, that God's grace and mercy is greater than all my sin. That the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. The grace of God teaches me tonight that there are none too bad that cannot be saved. And there are none too good that don't need to be saved. The problem that fallen humanity encounters tonight is this. They will have no difficulty in agreeing if you talk about a, a world that is got out of control. They will have no difficulty agreeing with you about a world that is broken and battered and the awful things that are happening in our world today. A man with eyes to see, a woman with ears to hear, cannot help but come to that conclusion. But man, when you press it a little further, and when the rubber hits the road, and you say the problem with our world and its brokenness is because men and women are broken. They're not living the way God ever intended to live. They're not living in a relationship with God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And the reason why men and women are not, are not living in the relationship that God wants them to live in is because they are sinners and they refuse to acknowledge that they are sinners. And unless a person comes to that place of acknowledging that they are sinners, they will never be saved. Mm -hmm. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. Here's a corrective word. Here is a destructive word because it destroys any notion that somehow or other I can save myself. It destroys any notion that somehow or other I can make it my own. I can make it on my own. That somehow or other there is merit in me that will make me acceptable to God. It's an instructive word. It instructs me to a life that is pleasing and glorified to the Almighty. And it's an effective word. I've said tonight, putting the words of Fanny Crosby said, the vilest offender who truly believes. Grace has found men and women in the depths of sinful depravity. Do you know something? That's where grace finds them. That's not where grace leaves them. That's where grace finds them. But that's not where grace leaves them. You see, grace changes lives. Grace works in our hearts and lives that we begin to follow after God. We begin to renounce the things that displease God. And we seek to live a life that is honouring and glorifying to God. Not hoping, even as Christians, that we will live a good enough life to get to heaven. You know, I've spoken to Christians and they, they, they almost would insinuate that, you know, unless you live a real spiritual life, you will never be in heaven. <clears throat> we're not in heaven because of anything that we have done. We are in heaven because of everything that Christ has done for us at the cross. Mm -hmm. Oh, tonight, what a glorious word is this word, grace. <laughs> we have been justified fully by his grace. This was the truth that set a young man free from the bondage <laughs> and burden of a religion that terrorized him and tortured him and kept him in the darkness of nature's eyes. The just, the righteous, those who are right with God. That's what the word righteous means. Those who are right with God live by faith. 
They live by faith. They live by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all of grace. It's the basis of our acceptance before a holy God. It is the beauty of our adornment in the presence of a holy God. Clothed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before his throne. It is not only the basis of our acceptance and the beauty of our adornment, it is the blessedness of our assurance. We are saved tonight. We are made fit for God's eternal home tonight, not because of anything that we have done or are doing or can ever do. It is because of God's matchless, marvelous and miraculous grace. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily, I am constrained to be. Robert Murray McShane was a godly <coughs> Presbyterian minister who died at a very young age, 27. God moved in his heart. And one day, while he was away from home, he was called home. When he arrived at home, he was informed that his brother had passed away. And he was ushered into the room where his brother was standing, or where his brother was lying in the coffin. And he says, as I stood looking into that coffin, God said to me, Robert, if that were you, where would you be in eternity? McShane said, eventually a voice came, lost, lost, and lost forever. That was a, a very significant experience that brought him safely to Christ. A few years later, he wrote these words, I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew not my danger and felt not my load. No friends spoke in rapture of Christ and the tree. Jehovah's akin you, the Lord my righteousness was nothing to me. When free grace awoke me by light from on high, and legal fear shook me, I trembled to die. No refuge, no safety, and self could I see. Jehovah's akin you, my Savior must be. My terrors all vanished before the sweet name. My guilty fears banished with boldness I came to drink of that fountain, life giving and free. Jehovah, my righteousness is all things to me, even treading the valley, the shadow of death. This watchword shall rally my faltering breath, for when from life's fever my God sets me free, Jehovah, second you. My death song shall be. The just shall live by faith. It's a corrective word. It's a destructive word. It is an instructive word. It's an effective word. Oh, tonight, if you've never experienced the grace of God, may you experience this evening. And may you live in the good of till traveling days are done. May God bless his word to our hearts. Let's pray to God. <coughs> but as we sit quietly in prayer, I'm going to ask that we pray the words of this soul sung by Mildred Greeley. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer here. And after she has sung this song, then we will stand and sing our final hymn.
word reminds us tonight that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Pour your grace into our hearts and into our lives and accomplish that which pleases you. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. We tell to sing, my hope is built on nothing less than the tune of Cornerstone. Let's stand to sing, please. Thank you. <coughs>
Savior, the rock of our salvation, the one upon whom we depend for heaven and for every day we live. We thank you for your presence with us, part us in your fear and with your favor. And may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon us and all whom we love this night through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.